Dean, Rob, thank you for joining us again here on Reluctant Preppers. Pleasure to be with you again, Dunnigan. In the past, we've talked quite a bit about what you call the epic battle of globalism versus sovereign states, and we've led the whole uh, way up to this buildup of the election of Donald Trump, and it seems against all odds um, he's been able to overcome the uh, forces that were arrayed against him and to take the, the actual presidency in the U.S. now for a couple days. And if you could just give us uh, first your insight into what you saw playing out in the actual uh, lead up to his victory, and then now what you see uh, from your vantage point in the research that you do on what the actions you see him starting to take and what you think uh, impact that's going to have. Uh, well, Donegan, first and foremost, I, I view uh, President Trump's ascendancy as, as absolutely stunning. Um, as, as Gerald Salenti has said recently, uh, post-election, uh, tr Trump's, Trump's win has been miraculous from the standpoint that he beat everybody. He didn't just beat the globalists, or you know, he, he beat the bankers, he beat the Clintons, he beat the Bushes, he beat Hollywood, he beat academia, and he beat the media. And he laid waste to all of them, their best efforts to derail his candidacy and his legitimacy. And now what we've seen since his swearing in on Friday, We've seen action on the uh, Affordable Care Act, which is, you know, which is about, which makes about as much sense as the uh, as Homeland Security or the uh, 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 or the Patriot Act, as I refer to it as the Unpatriot Act. We've seen action on the um, uh, on on the pipeline pipeline issue, which is which is something that's talked about in in. Uh, amazing depth and detail in my country, in Canada, uh, with the uh, with the signing of executive orders, uh, uh, clearing the way for uh, the Keystone Pipeline to be to be built to allow Alberta oil to travel down to the Gulf Coast, and no doubt he will he will encounter a lot of uh, uh, tree huggers and and the uh, environmentalists uh, as, as they as they try to move through to the uh, permitting stage of that, but. He's taking very, very bold action, and I'll tell you what, what I find absolutely refreshing and quite amazing. For the first time in, I don't know, maybe 20 years at least, uh, probably dating back at least to, to the Reagan era, America has a leader who's championing the American cause and uh, seems to have the American uh, uh, citizen in, in his uh, you know, in in his thoughts, uh, because that seems to be what's dictating his his moves, and uh, I, I can honestly say it, it must be quite an, a a refreshing and invigorating time uh, to be an American and to uh, and to wake up and to and to see the actions, uh, you know, in, in such a very short period of time. It just seems to me that he's he's going after this with with stunning. Uh, uh, you know, a stunning demeanor and uh, and determination, and you know he still doesn't even have his, his entire cabinet uh, right. uh, approved yet. But I mean, it seems to be full speed ahead, and no doubt he's gonna he's gonna run run into some speed bumps along the way. But uh, it, it sure is refreshing to see somebody take such decisive action. It's uh, throughout his uh, candidacy, we saw, uh, we mentioned about an array of forces being, you know, spread out against him. I mean, there was, there was the uh, first. It was well, he can't be a serious candidate. Uh, he's just a joke. He's just, he's just the, you know, color commentary on the side. And then actually, when he could not be denied that he was a serious uh, contender, then it was like, well, well, he's he's a distasteful, objectionable, uh, you know, pariah, and it's like, well, actually, he's going to win the nomination. All of a sudden, the even his own party had to flip around and start supporting him because he was going to, he was just basically taking, uh, pulling the rug out from underneath uh, them by his popular support. And then after he got the nomination, there's uh, the whole thing about delegitimizing through false. Uh, polls and then when the polls uh, showed in, in the actual voting showed that that he, he had a 
popularity he had. Then they were talking about recounts, and after they're talking about recounts, and finally, was, what was the last thing? Was uh, oh, martial law should be imposed to prevent him from taking office, and and now oh, sure. oh in between there, there was uh, the Russians stole the elections, and then and now that he's in office, it seems that he's he's having to continually to outmaneuver. Because one of the things people have warned that he could be stopped by the most is by, by the inertia of uh, the vested interest in, that can can grind anybody to a halt in Washington. But it seems like he's he's making fast moves, as you mentioned, or, you know, uh, bypassing the media, tweeting directly to the public, and and uh, just taking uh, direct actions. That and you you talk to people. There's a hot and cold. Uh, depending who you're talking to, uh, but in the uh, middle of the country where we live, uh, most of the people we talk to uh, seem to be uh, actually quite uh, inspired and actually uh, guardedly optimistic that this could finally be someone who's actually going to do what they said they were going to do. And uh, I know that some people do hand-wringing about that, but it seems that there is the over-representation on the part of the Hollywood elite and the media uh that have you know more than their share of the microphone uh, that are doing the hand wringing and people who are in, you know influenced by that uh, following suit. But but uh, when you really get down to it, a lot of these uh, just almost baffling accusations of he's focusing too much on American exceptionalism, America first, or national interest and that sort of thing. It's like you're actually criticizing the leader of a country for uh, wanting the best for his country. Uh, it's it's almost uh, beyond belief. But, uh, no, to, to be honest with you, Dunnigan, I, I find it quite inspiring uh, what 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 Trump is doing, and in and in such a very short period of time, and um, you know this 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 is something that's been I don't know in 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 my view long overdue, and how effective <clears throat> Mr. Trump has been or President Trump has been is probably best illustrated or summed up by the reaction or the, the speech given by uh, Joe Biden at, at the Davos uh, meeting uh, just days ago uh, last week, where he, where he literally, in a, in a, almost in a raise the white flag speech, started talking about how the glo globalist movement has been uh, it, it, I would, I would rather guess, in my view anyway, irreparably damaged. And the uh, uh, we also had uh, headlines in our in our media saying that uh, uh, China was going to Davos. The leader of China was going to Davos to champion the globalist cause. Well, I, I think I think the I think the globalist cause is is probably at very best at this point. Uh, doing a retreat. So I find this very refreshing because at the root of this whole globalist movement, um, as we've talked about in the past, this globalist movement that we refer to is, is eugenics based. These are people, uh, uh, the group collectively known as the globalists are people who, who think that uh, mankind is destroying the planet. And these are, these are people that that wish the population of the planet to be reduced from 7 billion down to 500 million. And these, these are the people that, uh, you know, have brought us things like GMO foods. Um, and, and that's all part of their eugenics program to uh, uh, effectively, effectively sterilize us and or dumb us down and redu reduce fertility rates, you see. And that's the whole eugenics approach to the global program to reduce the earth's population uh you know they either do it through war or they do it through uh, uh through pharma uh by you know by by rendering us sterile um, and and this this has been a this has been a long practiced and and well thought out uh, program of these people and the globalists once again uh to put brackets around them these are the people, uh, uh, the Rockefellers, uh, the Rothschilds, the old banking families, um, and, and the uh, and in the modern day, uh, uh, the acolytes uh, carrying out their their work are the the, the names like Maurice Strong, uh, Henry Kissinger, Zygmunt Brzezinski, uh, um, the uh, Nazi collaborator uh, George Soros. Um, and you know it's it's so nice it's so nice to see uh, the wickedness of these people 
with their contempt for humanity to uh, encounter something as uh, vibrant and as, uh, I don't know, like, I, I, I can't help but get the vibe that Trump loves people. Trump loves people and wants to see people do better. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I believe he takes that from uh, uh, and has a sincere appreciation uh, because he, he was made a very wealthy man by free markets in America. And uh, he's, he's pretty much accomplished about, about all any human being could accomplish for themselves. And I, I truly believe the man is now of the mind that he wants to give back. Because to be honest with you, uh, I'm, I'm amazed that he would take the job. Because th this, this is a job, in my view, that doesn't necessarily have a whole lot of upside uh, for somebody at his age with his means, why he didn't just ride off into the sunset. And, uh, you know, it just seems to me he's answering to a higher power. And it's 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 amazing, quite frankly, to sit back and just soak it up. One quote that he uh, he said in his inaugural address uh, stuck out to me, and it was he said something I'm, I might not per perfectly capture this, but when you truly embrace patriotism, there is no room for prejudice. And at first, that seems like well, what is that? Because people who've been accusing him of being racist and xenophobic and prejudicial and bigoted and so on by saying he wants to uh, put limits on you know immigration to the country and and remove people who are who have uh, violent criminal backgrounds, etc. Um, a but you hear that and and it echoes something that you just said about his true love for people. Uh, he he both truly wants what is best. for for our country, and he, and he recognizes and respects and acknowledges any other, every other leader of other countries to do the same for their countries, and and uh, that vibrancy that that you described is just is part of um, the vitality of uh, standing up and being a vigorous living organism, and in your country is another can be vigorously alive and 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 uh, doing its very best for itself, and uh, I think that uh, I just appreciate you having alerted us months and months ago to the how this is part of a much grander drama playing out uh and and i think you're right in that when we see the array of forces that have come up against him it's like you must be, you must be pushing a button because if everybody's rising up against you uh all these elite who have clearly made a mess of things um maybe you're actually going to you know, shake up the cage and, and really get something done. So we, there's a lot of people that are uh, quite hopeful um, uh, here in the States uh, looking for the improvements that can, that can come from this. I wonder if you could bring it t for us to the individual, both how this plays out. Uh, if, if you see what you see already, what do you believe that Trump is going to do going forward uh, in, in broad strokes? And what do you think the real impact of that will be uh, if you could maybe look at it uh, economically if you can look at it um, uh, some of the health of of markets health of the currencies health of the um, the the real ability to is there any chance of of uh, getting to the point where we can pay off debt uh, is there any chance that that there's a way that we can come out with a soft landing here uh, where we won't end up with a catastrophic end uh, to things how do you see things playing out going forward well, um, I'm, uh, w while, while I'm optimistic and encouraged by the early signs of what, of what uh, President Trump is doing, I'm also a realist in that uh, a, lot, a lot of the programs that he has on the, on the docket right now entail massive, massive fiscal stimulus and spending, uh, which is going to mean uh, deficits uh, going forward, at least in the near term, that are going to be rather extraordinary. And what what I'm having trouble grappling with is where where the appetite's going to come from for the uh, for the new debt that's going to have to be raised, and, and how it's going to be raised because America's uh, two biggest uh, traditional financiers being China and Japan, have been uh, increasingly showing that they don't have appetite for more uh, US, U.S. debt. 
And I mean, numbers released last week by the U.S. Treasury uh, indicate that China has, uh, you know, reduced their holdings of U.S. government debt uh, by a record amount since last May to the tune of $195 billion worth. Uh, Japan, since last July, uh, they've reduced U.S. Uh, debt holdings to the tune of $66 billion. And the interesting thing I would add to that is, as I read an article today that was written clearly by somebody of the uh, uh, anti-Trump ilk who, who tried to be dismissive of the notion that China and Japan weren't buying as much American debt, and they made a statement that, well, you know, Europe, Europe is the ones are the ones buying the are the ones buying the American debt, and they were basically trying to uh, trying to suggest that Europe Europe will pick up the slack. Well, you know, the third largest holder of U.S. government securities in their in their reserve account just happens to be Ireland, and Ireland is a country of six million people. Uh, they have a GDP of $240 billion, roughly, and they have, uh, they have US, uh, uh, US, debt reserve, uh, U.S. debt holdings in their reserve, their reserve account of $275 billion. So they've got, they've got well in excess of their GDP uh, held in U.S. government securities in their, in their foreign reserve account. Um, that's that's preposterous to begin with, and and the notion or the suggestion that that entities like like this or the UK whose finances sovereign finances are a disgrace also, the the notion that you know or Italy or or France, these countries are all close to if not insolvent now, with a with a with a with a governor of the European Central Bank, Mario Draghi, who's been printing money and, and, and expanding the ECB's balance sheet uh, like at, at an unprecedented clip, the notion that they can continue to, to finance and support uh, uh, a new round of American spending is, is it, in, my, in my honest belief, it's a dog that doesn't hunt and it won't happen. So w where does that leave us? That to me spells that the U.S. Treasury, in cahoots with the Federal Reserve, will be forced into uh, another round of QE or monetization of U.S. debt, which to me means that somewhere down the road here we are going to experience some inflation, and I do believe that the inflation that we're going to experience is going to be rather stiff. And there's a lot of people, uh, uh, maybe above my pay grade, who thinks that it's quite possible we could even tip into a hyperinflationary environment very quickly. So, you know, there there are some there are some seriously difficult challenges uh, ahead. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, I, I guess I'd rather see Americans work, working, and, uh, and then not working. Uh, because uh, the, the the program that uh, President Trump has indicated he's going to be on is going to at least put Americans back to work. And whether they're going to be working for diminished dollars uh, or not, uh, because I believe they are going to be working for diminished dollars or dollars that don't spend, don't, don't buy as much as they previously did, uh, I think that is pretty much written into the, into this, into the way forward. And uh, how we deal with this on a go-forward basis could be tricky, and, and it's going to be—it's—it's it's a sticky wicket. But you know, this—this this is what happens when you you mismanage and 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 exercise poor stewardship of a currency, and particularly when that currency happens to be the world's reserve currency, it can create very big issues, and we're going to surely be facing some in the very near future. On that theme of it's better to have your population working than not, I actually heard an interesting perspective today about Chinese uh, oversupply. We've heard for more than a year now that, the, well, way more than a year, that the Chinese have uh, industry after industry have just uh, created this wall of supply way beyond their ability to consume it, whether it was in steel, 
whether it was in uh, some concrete, whether it's in solar, uh, electronics, and so on. Uh, and that causes just people then turn to it and say it's a, a dumping of those on the world market when they can't absorb that that supply internally, and they expect the world to then to to uh, to buy it, and they'll just make the price lower and lower. Some people see that as as uh, as shrewd. Um, positioning yourself, uh, basically buying out incumbency in the market and buying market share. Other people say, no, they're just solving to for full employment at home because the alternative to, to when you have rampant unemployment in a country like China is civil unrest and this huge uh, imbalanced population of more males than females and you've got all these unemployed males. Uh, you end up with uh, revolutionary thoughts going on. So it's it's less expensive. It's actually the cheapest unemployment program you can have is to just provide employment. Uh, do you do you see things that way that that going forward, a uh, Trump full employment uh, through large you know uh, infrastructure programs and that kind of thing, it just becomes basically a large scale unemployment program uh, in the form of at least putting people to work and, and building out your, your country's infrastructure? My, my honest guess is at this point, uh, we're very likely to see uh, a spending war. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to call it a spending war. Other people would say it's a, uh, a, a race in currency devaluation. Uh, it's, it's often cliched or referred to as a race to the bottom with currency. But I do believe that uh, China will will try to spend uh, or outspend uh, Trump's plans, uh, and Trump will then double down and, and 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 increase his spending. But I mean, ultimately, Don. Again, I think what we're, what we're headed for in the in the very very near future now, in the immediate future, I think I think we're looking at. at uh, monetization of debt because a lot of new debt is going to be created to to put forward the uh, aggressive uh, fiscal uh, programs that Trump has on the board, and uh, uh, he's also he's also been very very uh, vocal about his unwillingness to have um, uh, call it unfair trade relationships with with anybody. Uh, and and I would I would suggest that that is aimed probably more at China than anyone else, and uh, which is going to leave China trying to, to uh, probably undermine their own currency to uh, grab a bigger share of trade on the world stage, even if it's not with America. So we're going to have we're going to have in my view anyway we're going to have competing devaluations, uh, and and this and this war. This currency war is going to escalate, and it could es escalate quite dramatically. And if it isn't handled right, it could very easily end up in, you know, military, hostile military conflict. How would you see that playing out? I mean, uh, both countries trying to uh, devalue their currency, uh, outspend each other. United States putting up protective tariffs to prevent import of Chinese goods. China then turning around and saying to the rest of the world, well, we're going to devalue our currency so that our goods look more attractive to the rest of the world. How does that, how does that drive the kind of tensions that would, that would flare up as military action? Well, I mean, you know, if you, if you look back, if you look back at the, uh, you know, the cause of, uh, uh, or, or America's entry into the second world war, with with Japan uh, uh, with Japan uh, you know attacking Pearl Harbor, um, you know the, the the history the history on this is 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 pretty well known that America basically placed an embargo on Japan and and stopped selling them oil, and without oil uh, Japan was in a very very difficult spot. They basically they basically put Japan in a spot where they had to and were forced to attack. Uh, uh, and so, and they created, and then they created. Effectively, it was an engineered event to to ultimately to get America in the war. Uh, and this this was an aim of the globalists back then. And you know, and isn't it isn't it amazing that you know bringing it up to relatively modern time, a lot of people have referred to 9/11 as the new the new Pearl Harbor, which which ushered in a. a 
you know, a litany of, uh, let's just say, uh, reduction of civil liberties, uh, uh, you know, the rise of the police state, uh, the degradation of, uh, uh, you know, of freedoms uh, that, you know, people in the Western world have, have you know, come to expect and, and, and believe were their inalienable rights. And it's amazing how quickly these were all harvested. And if you look at if you look at it, it's all been done really in the name of, uh, you know, the, this this uh, this globalist this globalist pursuit. So whether whether we get vectored back, whether whether the globalists or the people in control of the economy can make things so difficult that uh, and create conditions uh, so so difficult for for Trump that he loses his base of support. And if they're ever, ever able to to shunt him off to the side, um, you know, we could be right back into the right back into the stew pot with the uh, with the globalists calling the shots. So, you know, I think I think the way forward, the next year or two, or even maybe the next six months to a year, could be could be some very very telling times as to uh, you know where we're going to be five ten years from now. So uh, I I, uh, I hope and pray that uh, that uh, that he's able to keep keep the train on the tracks, um, and uh, <laughs> I wish him Godspeed. <laughs> Again, in your research of risks that are present in the uh, current economy, we talked here about about currencies, and you mentioned the world reserve currency. There's been some talk that Trump uh, actually has philosophically favors a gold-backed currency. Do you know if there's any truth behind that? And what if what reality do you think uh, will put, potentially play out regarding the role of precious metals in our in our currency going forward? Well, I, I would I would say this: if if Trump really is a a fan of uh, a gold standard or, uh, you know, gold as money, um, as he's pr been purported to be, um, I, I would, I would think that, uh, actions such as an, a, a full, a full and honest transparent audit of the U S gold reserve, uh, would be, would be a signal that he's very serious in, in that direction. Uh, but, but short of, but short of that, um, I've been I've been actually paying a lot of attention recently to the rise uh, and the and the uh, trading of uh, of Bitcoin uh, because I've become a I've become a believer in the blockchain uh, uh, technology and protocol as a as a means to uh, uh, store and and uh, and and convey uh, wealth um, and it and it's actually uh, in terms of a in terms of a, a means to convey uh, uh, things of value or wealth, it's it's a lot. It's the inherent in the blockchain technology is a lot more than just a currency, uh, uh, or its use as currency. Uh, the one thing I will say that makes me uh, a, a little bit reluctant to oh right endorse anything crypto is my firm belief that there is such a thing as an internet kill switch and anything that is crypto and anything that is housed on the internet in my view can be turned off and if you if you get if you get a little punch drunk and get a little bit too much of your wealth tied up in anything of a crypto nature my feeling is it could be erased uh, in an instant and uh, and and from that standpoint, it bothers me. Um, but it, what what I find sort of uh, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna call it, it it's a bit of a it's a bit of a, a, a perplexing um, you know it, it almost flies in the face of of rationality that a cryptocurrency. A cryptocurrency that does not exist in real form anywhere, um, but but through through algorithmic um, uh, application, uh, cannot be uh, bought, uh, cannot be sold unless you own it. Um, like there is no optionality on Bitcoin. 
You, you cannot sell Bitcoin short if you don't own Bitcoin. There are exchanges where you can, you can buy Bitcoin on margin, but you can only buy Bitcoin that exists. You cannot sell a Bitcoin that does not exist. And, you know, but then on the other side of it, you've got the precious metals, which are extremely finite, uh, like Bitcoin, um, and need to be mined out of, out of the earth uh, at, at great expense and effort. But these precious metals can be sold in infinite amounts, uh, in amounts that do not exist in, in, the, in the real world. And I just find it, I find it sort of a, it's, it's sort of a, a perplexing dichotomy that something that's real that needs to be mined out of the earth can be sold in infinite amounts uh, that will never exist uh, because we have regulators that don't do their jobs. But then on the other hand, we have something crypto that doesn't exist in real form anywhere uh, that you can't sell unless you own it. And as such, and this is the part that makes me uh, sit up and take note of Bitcoin in, in that because, because you can't sell Bitcoin that doesn't exist, it behaves more like an actual free market uh, than, than the metals, which are real. And it's, and, and it's, it's, it's almost, it's, it almost seems like it's, it's upside down from what it should be that something that's real and physical can be sold in infinite amounts and something that doesn't exist anywhere in physical form, you got to own it before you can sell it. <laughs> and, and, and that it's, that just seems upside down to me the way I think, but, but the aspect of it being a free market because of those qualities tells me that it, it, like, and, and and this and this runs against everything that I that I say regarding technical analysis. I think technical analysis might have more relevance in the Bitcoin market than than it has in thirty or forty years in the metals market. Sure, because technical analysis, uh, uh, like I fundamentally believe in the power of technical analysis. I just don't believe it works in in a, in a market where your inputs are contrived. Because, you know, what are you charting? You're, you're charting a fraud. And how you can get honest, honest uh, 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 direction from fraudulent inputs is above and beyond my ability to understand. But I, I view the inputs or the, or the price mechanism and, and the price points that we see in Bitcoin, uh, they're more real than anything that goes on in the metals market. So... Anyway, it's there. It's interesting the dichotomy between the two, and uh, uh, it 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 just seems to me that, I mean, look, more than anything, the rise of Bitcoin just just reinforces the notion that the world is 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 not accepting yeah. the status quo. Uh, they're they're not happy with the uh, uh, functionality of the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency, which is why, which is why uh, uh, there's so much effort being put into creating something that's a viable alternative. And whether Bitcoin ultimately ends up being it or not, it's almost irrelevant. But what it does show is that tremendous amount of time and effort is being spent to find an alternative because fiat currencies have shelf lives. And our current fiat currency regime is very long in the tooth. Back on that uh, similar vein, you mentioned a possible uh, audit of gold reserves. What about, do you believe we will have an audit of the Fed under Trump administration? Um, I don't even know that, a, that an audit of the Fed w would be necessary. But, but uh, and, and I think that, in all honesty, I think that Trump would probably run into... Uh, uh, an enormous amount of backlash and headwind if he if he tries to pursue that, but uh, as the as the president of the of the United States to to have his uh, uh, you know the the, the the U.S. gold reserve is is certainly within his 
uh, ability to sign an executive, I would imagine anyway, to sign an executive order saying that there's going to be a very, very extensive and, and thorough uh, uh, transparent audit of the sovereign U.S. gold reserve. And, you know, I think, I think if that were to be undertaken, uh, I think, I think a, a complete horror story would be revealed that, that America quite possibly doesn't have any gold. So, I mean, it, there's a there's a part of this that you you could you could even say be careful what you wish for, but I mean if America's gold has been plundered and stolen, uh, maybe America would be best to deal with it and and to know and and for the people to know, uh, because if if anything would put put the icing on the cake for the globalists uh, for the rest of eternity, would be revelations that the, the uh, these human-loving globalists have have actually ransacked and looted the American uh, uh, gold reserve, and that it's that it's gone. And my attitude towards that is: let the chips fall where the chips fall. Do you think that the people would understand? You mentioned that there'd be this revelation, but who is going to connect it back to these globalists? I mean, you do because you've been doing this analysis, and people who've been subscribing to you do. But do you think the common man? I mean. Actually, you know, you have pointed out that in Trump's speeches, uh, he does put the finger right on the globalists and say that he's, he has talked about these global trade agreements. And he has one of the actions he's already taken in the first two days is, is, is taking steps to get us out of the TPP. Um, but do you think that the common person would understand that just because the U.S. doesn't have gold, that means that it was it was mismanaged by globalist forces? Do you think that that would actually cause a mind shift? Well, yes, and and because I I truly believe I mean you asked a little bit earlier uh, what what my thoughts would would be or the the likelihood of of Trump uh, ordering an audit of the Fed uh, if we found out that the gold was in fact gone I think people would be very quick to to label the Fed as the perpetrator or the facilitator of 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 the removal of the gold which in in essence would bring down the in my view, anyway, would probably bring down the curtain on central banking, probably globally, because it would probably lead to audits in in other in other nations. And uh, I mean, my research over the years has told me that central banks around the world have been practicing uh, let's just let's just call it what it is, fraudulent accounting with regards to their gold reserves, where they where they count gold that has left the vault because it's been leased, uh, is still counted on the same line as any gold that might be present in the vault. And, uh, and, and in this manner, uh, gold reserves around the world have been double counted for a great many years, and which, which has left, which has left the, the, the whole structure of the gold market as a very, very opaque and murky uh, picture in terms of how much gold is there really in the world, and, and and who owns it, and uh, and ha and how many times over has it been sold, or been subscribed to, and these these are things these are things in my view that are required before we get back to uh, uh, any sort of a, a monetary uh, um, regime or currency regime that people will actually have faith in. Um, because dishonest dishonest money uh, it does not engender uh, uh, good international relationships or honest commerce. And uh, you know if the world if the world's situation is to be righted, I think we need to have honest honest commerce, honest money, and honest commerce. And uh, you know fraudulent. I mean this is even talked about in the in the Bible. I mean the Bible espouses. That you got to have honest weights and measures, or you're going to have big problems. Well, I'll tell you what: our world's been operating for a lot of years with dishonest money, dishonest weights and measures, and you know, it's it's not really a big wonder why the world's in the mess that it is, with with conflict all over the place, because we've been we've been you know using dishonest money for a very long time. And uh, it's not it's not good uh, for, as I said, for international relations when you're when you're the uh, perpetrator or the operator of dishonest money. 
we always ask this at the end is how does this come down to the individual homeowner, the individual head of household just trying to take care of their family, reduce risks? Most people are just overwhelmed with the thought of these huge, huge, elite, global, mysterious powers that are beyond our grasp. You've given us always uh, an eye-opening heads up that these forces are at play, these forces are at work, not to take things at face value. But what, again, given what we know now and the, given the direction, the trend that you see uh, developing are some prudent steps that an individual can take uh, to take care of business, uh, reduce risk for their individual family. Well done again. Um, as as we've as we've said at the conclusion, every time we've ever spoken, and as your namesake, uh, reluctant preppers uh, implies, um, you know, you're 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 probably doing yourself a world of good if you have some of your investable assets in physical precious metal. Uh, it might it might be a very very intelligent thing to to own some storable storable food and it might also uh, be intelligent to have a means to protect both of the above or you know both of those two underscored things and i would i would suggest more than ever going forward these this is this is just a prudent course of action uh, uh you know to to ensure that you're at least going to have a fighting chance to whether what in my in my mind and in my view is absolutely guaranteed to come anyway we got we got tough we got tough times ahead of us we have tough times ahead of us and you know what and 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 that's that's with trump doing that's even with trump doing great work we we have tough tough times and uh, you know what and frankly frankly a speedy a speedy audit of the us gold reserve uh, in my view, would would uh, would cement his uh, it would it would cement his position, and it would and it would also open up the floodgates for him to start rounding people up, because I think these roundups have to come. That's the other thing is the sooner that it would happen, the the more uh, obvious it would be to everyone that this happened when he wasn't minding the store. This was happened before. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like, and then it's like, it would. I think it would it would give him a lot of leeway. To uh, lay down, lay down the uh, lay down the leather on a lot of these people, you know, because because it would resonate with people. He could say, you know, look, the who who who's been in charge of America for the last thirty years? It's been the Bushes and the Clintons, and uh, you know, these these are the pe these are the people I tried tried to tell you who who were who were engaged in in bad stuff in illegal stuff. These are the people I told you who were robbing you blind. These are the people, and you know what? And I don't know. In my view, if he was smart, he would be on that right away. Well, we'll have to keep our eyes open for that because it certainly seems that things are unfolding at a very rapid clip uh, yes. right out of the gate here. So there's yeah. there's certainly chance for that. Well, I don't know. To me, to me, it that would be a very logical thing for him to do. And uh, because, I, like I say, I think and I think it would give him a lot of room to operate. If uh, if that got underway, because then then he could then the mud like that would actually be the shit hitting the fan, but that would also create and could also create a a a complete you know. I mean you know you want to see you want to see gold going up three four five hundred dollars a day. Yeah, yeah, that could and be. A, it you want to see silver up crisis. twenty thirty forty bucks a day. Uh, that would do it. Yeah, it's ironic because it would seem to a lot of people that that was the start of a crisis, but actually, <laughs> the crisis has been going all along. That's just when they found out about it. <laughs> yes. Oh yeah. But I mean, hey, you know what? I think we're. I think we're. I think we're in a window where where that sort of thing is likely now. Well, Rob, we've always are grateful for your visits here with us here on Reluctant Preppers. And again, if people uh, on your website, we've, uh, when you go to KirbyAnalytics.com, there are a number of uh, introductory uh, 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 articles that really start leading off uh, very intriguing leadoffs. Uh, and then, as we understand it, in order to get full access to that, uh, people have the opportunity to subscribe. Can you just let people know where they can find out more? Yeah, well, you can find me on the web at kirbyanalytics.com. Uh, you know, I 
I do I do uh, some written paid uh, commentary, and uh, there's there's also a good uh, a good uh, there's there's a very very large archive in the member section, and there's a substantial amount uh, uh, posted on the uh, flag speech. So started talking about how the globe globalist movement has been. Uh, it, it, I would, I would rather guess, in my view anyway, irreparably damaged. And the uh, uh, we also had uh, headlines in our in our media saying that uh, uh, China was going to Davos. The leader of China was going to Davos to champion the globalist cause. Well, I, I think I think the I think the globalist cause is is probably at very best at this point. Uh, doing a retreat. So I find this very refreshing because at the root of this whole globalist movement, um, as we've talked about in the past, this globalist movement that we refer to is, is eugenics based. These are people, uh, uh, the group collectively known as the globalists are people who, who think that uh, mankind is destroying the planet. And these are, these are people that that wish the population of the planet to be reduced from 7 billion down to 500 million. And these, these are the people that, uh, you know, have brought us things like GMO foods. Um, and, and that's all part of their eugenics program to uh, 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 effectively, effectively sterilize us and or dumb us down and redu reduce fertility rates, you see. And that's the whole eugenics approach to the global program to reduce the earth's population uh you know they either do it through war or they do it through uh, uh through pharma uh by you know by by rendering us sterile um, and and this this has been a this has been a long practiced and and well thought out uh, program of these people and the globalists once again uh to put brackets around them these are the people, uh, uh, the Rockefellers, uh, the Rothschilds, the old banking families, um, and the uh, and in the modern day, uh, uh, the acolytes uh, carrying out their their work are the the, the names like Maurice Strong, uh, Henry Kissinger, Zygmunt Brzezinski, uh, um, the uh, Nazi collaborator uh, George Soros. Um, and you know it's it's so nice it's so nice to see uh, the wickedness of these people it, with their contempt for humanity to uh, encounter something as uh, vibrant and as uh, I don't know like I, I I can't help but get the vibe that Trump loves people Trump loves people and wants to see people do better. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I believe he takes that from uh, uh, and has a sincere appreciation uh, because he, he was made a very wealthy man by free markets in America. And uh, he's, he's pretty much accomplished about, about all any human being could accomplish for themselves. And I, I truly believe the man is now of the mind that he wants to give back because, to be honest with you, uh, I'm I'm amazed that he would take the job because th this this is a job in my view that doesn't necessarily have a whole lot of upside uh, for somebody at his age with his means. Why he didn't just ride off into the sunset and uh, you know it just seems to me being China and Japan have been uh, increasingly showing that they don't have appetite for more uh, U.S. U.S. debt. And I mean, numbers released last week by the U.S. Treasury uh, indicate that China has, uh, you know, reduced their holdings of U.S. government debt uh, by a record amount since last May to the tune of $195 billion worth. Uh, Japan, since last July, uh, they've reduced U.S. Uh, debt holdings to the tune of $66 billion. And the interesting thing I would add to that is, as I read an article today that was written clearly by somebody of the uh, uh, anti-Trump ilk, who who tried to be dismissive of the notion that China and Japan weren't buying as much American debt, 
and they made a statement that well you know Europe Europe is the ones are the ones buying the are the ones buying the American debt and they were basically trying to uh, trying to suggest that Europe Europe will pick up the slack well you know the third largest holder of US government securities in their in their reserve account just happens to be Ireland and Ireland is a country of 6 million people uh, they have a GDP of $240 billion, roughly, and they have, uh, they have US, uh, uh, US, debt reserve, uh, U.S. debt holdings in their reserve, their reserve account of $275 billion. So they've got, they've got well in excess of their GDP uh, held in U.S. government securities in their, in their foreign reserve account. Um, that's that's preposterous to begin with and and the notion or the suggestion that that entities like like this or the uk whose finances sovereign finances are a disgrace also the the notion that you know or italy or or france these countries are all close to if not insolvent now with a with a with a with a governor of the European Central Bank, Mario Draghi, who's been printing money and, and, and expanding the ECB's balance sheet uh, like at, at an unprecedented clip, the notion that they can continue to to finance and support uh, uh, a new round of American spending is is it, in my in my honest belief, it's a dog that doesn't hunt and it won't happen. So where does that leave us? That to me spells that the U.S. Treasury, in cahoots with the Federal Reserve, will be forced into uh, another round of QE or monetization of U.S. debt, which to me means that somewhere down the road here we are going to experience some inflation, and I do believe that the inflation that we're going to experience is going to be rather stiff. And there's a lot of people, uh, uh, maybe above my pay grade, who thinks that it's quite possible we could even tip into a hyperinflationary environment very quickly. So, you know, there there are some there are some seriously difficult challenges uh, ahead. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, I, I guess I'd rather see America. He's answering to a higher power, and, and it's it's it's. It's amazing, quite frankly, to sit back and just soak it up. One quote that he uh, he said in his inaugural address uh, stuck out to me, and it was he said something. I'm, I might not per perfectly capture this, but when you truly embrace patriotism, there is no room for prejudice. And at first, that seems like, well, what is that? Because people who've been accusing him of being racist and xenophobic and prejudicial and bigoted and so on by saying he wants to uh, put limits on, you know, immigration to the country and and remove people who are who have uh, violent criminal backgrounds, etc. Um, a, but you hear that and and it echoes something that you just said about his true love for people. Uh, he he both truly wants what is best. for for our country, and he, and he recognizes and respects and acknowledges any other, every other leader of other countries to do the same for their countries, and and uh, that vibrancy that that you described is just is part of um, the vitality of uh, standing up and being a vigorous living organism, and, and your country is another can be vigorously alive and 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 uh, doing its very best for itself, and uh, I think that uh, I just appreciate you having alerted us months and months ago to the how this is part of a much grander drama playing out uh and and i think you're right in that when we see the array of forces that have come up against him it's like you must be, you must be pushing a button because if everybody's rising up against you uh all these elite who have clearly made a mess of things um maybe you're actually going to you know, shake up the cage and, and really get something done. So we, there's a lot of people that are uh, quite hopeful um, uh, here in the States uh, looking for the improvements that can, that can come from this. I wonder if you could bring it t for us to the individual, both how this plays out. Uh, if, if you see what you see already, what do you believe that Trump is going to do going forward uh, in, in broad strokes? And what do you think the real impact of that 
will be. Uh, if you could maybe look at it uh, economically, if you can look at it, um, uh, some of the health of of markets, health of the currencies, health of the um, the the real ability to. Is there any chance of of uh, getting to the point where we can pay off debt? Uh, is there any chance that that there's a way that we can come out with a soft landing here, uh, where we won't end up with a catastrophic end uh, to things? How do you see things? playing out going forward well um i'm uh w while while i'm optimistic and encouraged by the early signs of what of what uh, president trump is doing i'm also a realist in that uh, a lot a lot of the programs that he has on the on the docket right now entail massive massive fiscal stimulus and spending uh, which is going to mean uh, deficits uh, going forward, at least in the near term, that are going to be rather extraordinary. And what what I'm having trouble grappling with is where where the appetite's going to come from for the uh, for the new debt that's going to have to be raised, and and how it's going to be raised because. America's uh, two biggest uh, traditional financiers, uh, you know, a stunning demeanor and uh, and determination, and you know he still doesn't even have his, his entire cabinet uh, right. uh, approved yet. But I mean, it seems to be full speed ahead, and no doubt he's gonna he's gonna run run into some speed bumps along the way, but. Uh, it, it sure is refreshing to see somebody take such decisive action. It's uh, throughout his uh, candidacy, we saw uh, we mentioned about an array of forces being you know spread out against him. I mean, there was there was the uh, first. It was well, he can't be a serious candidate. Uh, he's just a joke. He's just he's just the you know color commentary on the side. And then actually, when he could not be denied that he was a serious uh, contender then it was like well, well he's he's a distasteful objectionable uh you know pariah and it's like well actually he's going to win the nomination all of a sudden the even his own party had to flip around and start supporting him because he was going to he was just basically taking uh pulling the rug out from underneath uh, them by his popular support and then after he got the nomination there's uh the whole thing about delegitimizing through false uh polls and then when the polls uh, showed in, in the actual voting showed that that he, he had a popularity he had then they were talking about recounts and after they're talking about recount then finally was, what was the last thing was uh oh martial law should be imposed to prevent him from taking office and and now oh, sure. oh in between there there was uh, the russians stole the elections and then and now that he's in office it seems that he's he's having to continually to outmaneuver because one of the things people have warned that he could be stopped by the most is by, by the inertia of uh, the vested interest in, that can can grind anybody to a halt in Washington. But it seems like he's he's making fast moves, as you mentioned, or, you know, uh, bypassing the media, tweeting directly to the public, and and uh, just taking uh, direct actions. That and you you talk to people. There's a hot and cold. Uh, depending who you're talking to, uh, but in the uh, middle of the country where we live, uh, most of the people we talk to uh, seem to be uh, actually quite uh, inspired and actually uh, guardedly optimistic that this could finally be someone who's actually going to do what they said they were going to do. And uh, I know that some people do hand wringing about that, but it seems that there is the over representation on the part of the Hollywood elite and the media. Uh, that have you know more than their share of the microphone uh, that are doing the hand wringing and people who are in, you know influenced by that uh, following suit. But but uh, when you really get down to it, a lot of these uh, just almost baffling accusations of he's focusing too much on American exceptionalism, America first, or national interest and that sort of thing. It's like you're actually criticizing the leader of a country for uh, wanting the best for his country. Uh, it's it's almost uh, beyond belief. But, uh, no, to, to be honest with you, Dunnigan, I, I find it quite inspiring uh, what 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 Trump is doing, and in and in such a very short period of time, and um, you know this 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 is something that's been I don't know in 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 my view long overdue, and how effective <clears throat> Mr. Trump has been or President Trump has been is probably best illustrated or summed up by the reaction or the, the speech given by 
uh, Joe Biden at, at the Davos uh, meeting uh, just days ago uh, last week, where he where he literally in a in a almost in a raise the white. You know, Rob, thank you for joining us again here on Reluctant Preppers. Pleasure to be with you again, Dunnigan. In the past, we've talked quite a bit about what you call the epic battle of globalism versus sovereign states. And we've led the whole uh, way up to this buildup of the election of Donald Trump. And it seems against all odds, um, he's been able to overcome the uh, forces that were arrayed against him and to take the, the actual presidency in the U.S. now for a couple days. And if you could just give us uh, first your insight into what you saw playing out in the actual uh, lead up to his victory, and then now what you see uh, from your vantage point in the research that you do on what the actions you see him starting to take and what you think uh, impact that's going to have. Uh, well, Don, again, first and foremost, I, I view uh, uh, President Trump's ascendancy as, as absolutely stunning. Um, as, as Gerald Salenti has said recently, uh, post-election, uh, tr Trump's Trump's win has been miraculous from the standpoint that he beat everybody. He didn't just beat the globalists, or you know, he he beat the bankers, he beat the Clintons, he beat the Bushes, he beat Hollywood, he beat academia, and he beat the media, and he laid waste to all of them their best efforts to derail his candidacy and his legitimacy. And now what we've seen since his swearing in on Friday, we've seen action on the uh, Affordable Care Act, which is, you know, which is about, which makes about as much sense as the, uh, as Homeland Security or the, uh, 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 or the Patriot Act, as I refer to it as the Unpatriot Act. We've seen action on the um, uh, on on the pipeline pipeline issue, which is which is something that's talked about in in uh, amazing depth and detail in my country in Canada, uh, with the uh, with the signing of executive orders uh, uh, clearing the way for uh, the Keystone pipeline to be to be built to allow Alberta oil to travel down to the Gulf Coast. And no doubt he will he will encounter a lot of uh, uh, tree huggers and and the uh, environmentalists uh, as, as they as they try to move through to the uh, permitting stage of that. But he's taking very very bold action. And I'll tell you what what I find absolutely refreshing and quite amazing. For the first time in I don't know maybe 20 years at least, uh, probably dating back at least to to the Reagan era. America has a leader who's championing the American cause and uh, seems to have the American uh, uh, citizen in his, uh, you know, in his, in his thoughts, uh, because that seems to be what's dictating his his moves. And uh, I, I can honestly say it, it must be quite an, a, a refreshing and invigorating time uh, to be an American and to uh, and to wake up and to and to see the actions, uh, you know, in, in such a very short period of time, it just seems to me that he's he's going after this with with stunning uh, 